Okay, so um, in the next sort of, 15 minutes, we're going to talk about neural marketing. You've probably heard of the term. Uh, if you haven't, you're going to hear about it again anyway. So um, I want to start with a problem, because it's always a good part, part, place to start. You can imagine I'll probably lead on to a solution uh, later on. So I'm actually going to use a quote, just like Sean did. Uh, this quote's from the late, great David Ogilvy. And he said, the trouble with market research is that people don't think how they feel. They don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. So I couldn't put that any better to understand why we do what we do in companies within the neural marketing sphere actually work. So I've got three reasons why this is the case. So this is the sciencey bit, okay? So the first thing is that we are more emotional than we think. In fact, we're a lot more emotional than we think. And I don't know if you know anyone with uh, depression or mental disorders, they might find it difficult to wash themselves or even clean their teeth or tie their shoelaces. If you have no access to your emotions, then there's a big problem. You become sort of emotionally uh, or cognitively paralysed. People cannot make decisions. People who have bits of their brains knocked out from accidents and stuff, who can't have access to their emotions, can't make simple decisions. So one key thing is we all know that we're emotional, but when it comes to the decision making and the decision reaching process, emotions or non-conscious processes are so much more important than we think they might be. So the second point that I want to say is that we don't always make logical considered decisions when we actually think we do. So let's take a situation where, let's say, uh, you align yourself emotionally with some sort of new brand or new idea or stuff. What we actually do is we'll go out and seek evidence to back up that belief. So the stronger that emotional feeling, that connection that we have, then we start searching out evidence to back up this actual belief. So the stronger the emotion, the stronger the belief, and the greater the tendency to seek out the supporting evidence. So you see, we're not rational. Human beings are not rational, we are rationalizers. We rationalize our decision making, whereas nearly all of our decision making processing goes on outside of conscious awareness. And most people estimate that as about 90%. So, see, the thing is about neuroscience is uh, that today's neuroscience myths were yesterday's neuroscience facts. Things like, oh, 10% of our brain is used, the rest isn't. That's rubbish. Brain imaging shows that all our brain is used practically all the time. You've probably heard of left brain, right brain thinking. It's bollocks. Okay? <laughs> so there's loads of experiments that are actually showing that you know, the creative right brain side, well, give people creative activities, then all different parts of neural networks within the brain works. It's the same with this all oh, around left brain logical reasoning. Well, it might be logical, but it's nothing to do with the left or the right side of the brain. However, what I'm talking about today is based on the neuroscience, which is the big thing at the moment in science, trying to understand how we come to making decisions. So when I talk about decision making, I really mean decision reaching. So when you're thinking about your customers or your consumers, or your, you might call them targets, you've got to think of them as people and how they actually make their decisions. The third point, which is true, you might not like it, is that almost the entirety of what happens in your mental life is not under your conscious control. Now the truth is, it's actually better that way. Our consciousness takes all the credit, it can take as much credit as it wants, but it's best left on the sidelines. Things like our appetites, our instincts, our desires, our motivations, these are all non-conscious. They seem to be really easy, even our motor functions, we can run them and clean off. They don't seem to take much brain activity or brain power. They do, but they're all neural subroutines. They happen in autopilot. So our brain runs very, very efficiently in autopilot because our non-conscious part of the brain, or the non-rational part of the brain, does most of the thinking, then just tells our conscious part uh, most of the time. So some of you might be like, I don't like that. Because I've spoken to people like, well, you say that, but it makes me feel a little bit uneasy. But the truth is, this is the way that our brain actually works. So because we're not in control, we need to understand what is in control. So if 90% of our decision making goes on outside of conscious awareness, 
then when you want to know whether somebody likes something, they buy something, they, they align themselves with it, you shouldn't just rely on asking people what they think. Okay, so this is the general sort of marketing mantra that we see in all sorts of sites across the website. We think first, and then that leads to our feeling about what it actually means, and then we actually act and do upon it. Again, it's absolute rubbish. This isn't how it works, and this leads to a real problem within market research. This idea that we are rational, and we think, and we make decisions, and everything else goes on from that. The truth is that emotions power decision making, non-conscious processing decisions are, emotion, uh, are, uh, are decisions. So the truth is, we feel first. Our emotions, our non-conscious processes, are the first underlying base of all, practically, all of our decision making. Okay? So it's really important to understand that because market research generally relies on asking people what they think, okay, in some way or some form. But what it actually does is it stifles creativity. And the reason why you look really scared of what I'm talking about, sorry, <laughs> just stay like, shut up! So sorry. So, <laughs> so yeah, where was that? Yeah. So the problem with sort of market research survey groups, focus groups, is they can't sift the average ideas from the brilliant ones. And that's why creativity is stifled. Now, I'm not saying don't ask people what they think, because if somebody loves something or they hate something, look at a good enough answer if that's the question you're asking. However, as most of our decision making goes on in this sort of autopilot, then the key thing is if we can access that, and there are many ways to do this without sticking wires in people's heads or putting them in machines, we can get to understand how people come to the decisions and then we are much more likely to understand how people are going to behave. Okay, so there's the problem. What's the solution? Hey, well, it's neuromarketing. I would say that, wouldn't I, because that's what I do. So, it's not really. The solution is don't just ask people. There are other ways to do this. And so, because I've been asked to talk about neuromarketing and its future, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what sort of technologies and approaches are used and how it's already changed in the sort of 10 years we've been around. Because neuromarketing is a term sort of coined in about 2002, so it's been around for a while. Okay, so, fMRI, this is medical, you can see it's a nice big scanner, but this is used to look at how people make decisions, and it's also used to see what parts of the brain are active when decision making actually happens. Neuromarketing used this, or has used this as the gold standard. It's not used very much now, because it's not really customer friendly. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, yeah, it's really expensive and it's really scary. Oh, there by, it's my brain, by the way, down the side, from when I went to the scanner, so I'm really impressed that I've actually got a brain. Right. So, there was a guy called uh, Reed Montague, from your side guy, and um, he did the Pepsi Coke Challenge. We all know about the Pepsi Coke Challenge. If you drink Pepsi, you love it. If you, uh, if you know it's Pepsi, you hate it. That's generally the, the gist of it. And people buy Coke, even though they say they like Pepsi. So what actually happened is Reed Montague did this experiment inside the actual scanner. He gave people uh, Pepsi and Coke in a blind taste, and people, funnily enough, yeah, they actually preferred the Pepsi. In fact, the parts of their brain that lit up for the reward system actually said, yeah, I really like Pepsi. But he then told people what the drinks actually were. And what people found is they preferred Coke, just like they did when they're doing it on the street. But what was really interesting is their brain activity actually switched. They actually did prefer Coke more than they knew it was Coke. So what that actually did is show the effect of the brand on how people perceive the product. So that was a really important start to what this sort of neural marketing industry is. Now, it's not used as much now because of the sort of reasons I've already mentioned. And what it does is it measures the sort of blood flow in different parts of the brain, and, that, and, that's, uh, and that's how it works, more or less. Uh, EEG is a bit more customer friendly, but it still means sticking in either like a shower cap with wires in people's heads or sticking wires in people's heads. It measures the activity in the brain. It's really good for measuring really accurate moment by moment attention in the brain. It can see whether someone has a strong or an, uh, a weak uh, emotional response to something, uh, and it also works within memory coding. So <coughs> most of you may say, yeah, I've heard of EEG and how it does this and the fMRI, but the thing is that this was what neuromarketing was about, and the truth is that it's changed. Now, 
eye tracking, you think, well, if, is there anyone here who doesn't know about eye tracking or ever heard of it? Exactly. So eye tracking is sort of ubiquitous now, and we're going to see much more in our everyday lives. It tells us where people look. But it's a non-conscious uh, process that's sort of pushed into your marketing because it, it works out how people actually, uh, uh, what they see without them having to articulate a response. So what about the future? What about the new techniques in your marketing or the new approaches or, or the way that brands are actually using it at the moment? So I'm not sure whether anybody uses any of these, but it'd be interesting to talk to you after if you do. So the way that new marketing is moving forward is that there is uh, behavioural tests in a sort of digital online lab. The, way I, the reason why I say digital is because I'm a digital annex, but what I actually mean is stuff that's online. Because people want answers really, really quick. When it comes to setting up an experiment with an EEG or fMRI, it takes a lot of time to sort it all out, to get the people in, to do all the analysis. And in marketing, market research, A, is too expensive, B, but most of the time it just takes too long. So there are a whole range of tests now that could be used much more cheaply, quickly, and cost-effectively using uh, sort of online uh, platforms. So facial emotion encoding uses uh, high-definition cameras that looks at people's faces, and they can measure micro-movements in all the different muscles, and it can work out uh, people's emotions from their, uh, from their faces. So obviously, if you do a big smile, it says you're happy. If you do a big frown, it says you're sad or you're unhappy. This is used um, quite uh, often now with advertising just to give people a general idea of the sort of emotions. The difficulty is that all human beings have sort of, um, seven main emotions. There's sort of happiness and surprise, and there's mutual, but all the others are negative. It's all fear, sadness, disgust, uh, typical about human beings. But the problem with facial encoding is it tends to pick up the negative emotions more than positive. However, it's a really quick way that can be done online to give people an idea of how people are interacting with their uh, video, for example. So, the examples we've got on the screen here show ways of measuring visual attention. So, uh, what visual saliency is how much things stand out. So, for example, uh, that test on the left looks at whether different elements of, say, a book cover in different designs actually stand out by making something appear or disappear and seeing how long it takes people to click on it. Really simple principle, when you've got hundreds of people click when they see changes on different designs, you get to see which bits stand out and which don't. You can do eye tracking as well online now. It's not effective, but when you have many more people, you get plenty of data and it seems to be quite effective. Uh, there are other tools that are used as well that use sort of mouse tracking where people view, focus through uh, uh, a viewer and actually use cognitive load uh, uh, doing a secondary task to actually see what's going on. What I mean by that is we've actually got a finite capacity for attention. So if you test that, if you're walking down the street to somebody say, what's T plus T? We're going, oh, looking a bit funny as you're walking along the street. But if you say, well, 17 plus 74, they'll probably stop in their tracks because we're Computing that uh, mathematical sum, and then we're thinking, oh, right, uh, you stop walking. So try it, it's true, it actually works. So we have a limited capacity for attention. So if you get somebody to do a secondary task, you can see how engaged they are in the primary task, which might be looking at video, doing something simple, or navigating a website, or doing some sort of task. So there are different ways of measuring, measuring visual attention uh, quickly and effectively online. <coughs> um, Closer to traditional market research where we ask people, we get people to make a decision, we can measure gut feelings. So, for example, in this test, this uh, is something called category fit analysis, but essentially what it does is it asks people to make a decision. In this case, it's saying, would you buy the product on the left, or would you buy the product on the right? So you just press a key, left or right. You'll then be given another pair, and then another pair. So you make lots and lots of fast decisions, and what we can actually do is see you know, not just explicitly, explicitly what people choose, but we can see how long it takes them to make that decision. So what sort of results do we get from this? So just going back to our uh, examples, it might be that we've got three new product designs and we've got benchmark products. So in this case, just looking at percentages, the benchmark was chosen 54.3% of the time when it's presented against something else, so slightly more than half the time. 
MPD 1 didn't do quite as well. The two other MPDs, 3 and 4, actually were chosen about 62% of the time when they were presented on screen. And the colours, like traffic lights, any of the colours I'll show you in the next couple of graphs, are sort of traffic lights. So if people made decisions really quick, which made it an easy decision to make, then it's a, a nice green colour. If they were slow, it's yellow down to sort of red, red or really slow. So if you were looking at this, you'd probably go, mm, let's not do MPD1 because people don't have a, a preference for it. Uh, and on an implicit or sort of conscious level, there's not strength in the, in the decision that they actually made. Another way of presenting the data is, for the same data, if we were looking at comparing choices for the benchmark versus uh, the three MPDs, we can see that MPD1 was only chosen 33.7% of the time when it was presented with the benchmark, although the benchmark wasn't chosen very fast because it's red. So from looking at all of this data, you might say, well, if we were looking for a new MPD, we'd look at something like MPD3. Not only was it chosen most of the time, it beat the benchmark hands down and people made the choice and that decision really fast. So there are lots of little tricks. It's more psychology of decision making than neuroscience, but there are ways that go beyond just asking people what, what, what you think. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is what's called the implicit association testing. And this seems to be, for me, the main area in which uh, people are moving forwards with neural marketing online. So you're not asked to make a decision. The question that we're going to sort of answer here is, do people think Barclays Bank is trustworthy or untrustworthy compared to other banks? So the way the test works in this example you press two keys, just like on the last example. So if the word trustworthy comes up, you hit the left-hand key. If the word untrustworthy comes up, you hit the right-hand key. There might be three words that mean the same as trustworthy, and three words that mean the same as untrustworthy. So all you're doing is sorting these words. And for the first half of the test, you're also told, in this occasion here, it says or bank. So if a bank comes up, you hit the same key as untrustworthy. So you do this lots of times, maybe with lots of banks, it's quite boring. But at the end of the day, you finish the test, it takes about five minutes, you then repeat the test. But the second half of the test, you actually have Barclays paired with the same key as trustworthy. So what's going to happen is, to look at the results, we see half the test you're pairing Barclays with trustworthy, half with untrustworthy. If you make a decision faster, it's more intuitive, then that's better, and if you make more mistakes as well, that's worse. So how do we look at the results? So again, you might go, Ugh. well, let's actually take a huge amount of data here. Let's say not just that we looked at Barclays, but say we looked at five different banks. And let's say we didn't just look at trustworthy, but we looked at trustworthiness, friendliness, good value, uh, convenience, and ethical. So again, with a traffic-like sort of system, we can actually see how different banks did against each other. So this is all based around how quickly people make the decisions and how many mistakes that they actually make. So the principle here <coughs> is relatively simple. Um, most of these ideas have actually come from academia. They were not for marketing. In fact, the first uses of uh, the implicit association test was to see if people are racist or fatist. In fact, in America in the uh, early 1990s, this test was actually used to see if uh, police recruits were racist by showing them pictures of black and white faces and the word good and bad. And so they actually wheedled out certain people because they thought they might have a tendency towards uh, racism. So a bit contentious. So I may have done your heads in a little bit here, but I've just rattled through it. So just as a take home, basically all I want to say is that you know, our decisions, the decisions that we make, they're very much influenced by factors outside of our conscious awareness. And, and if you want to understand the real drivers of behaviour, then you've got to go beyond just asking what people say. And that's basically it. So thank you.